Hey, this is Digital by Computing. Today we're going to be talking about the coronavirus and what you may need to do from a technology perspective to ensure that uh, operations from an IT uh, perspective, their systems, uh, people working from home can also continue to operate as normal. We're going to go through some steps around a disaster recovery plan. Maybe what you want to look at potentially start having to think about implementing. Maybe you will need to implement a disaster recovery plan and maybe some tips and tricks and tools that you can use with your staff so that they can work from home in the event that you may need to shut an office down due to this coronavirus. So my name is Emilio and I work in the IT industry and today we're going to be talking about what you can start having a think about uh, from an IT perspective, implementing systems, services, processes, procedures uh, around this pandemic of the coronavirus that is happening globally. Uh, a lot of people are freaking out, a lot of things are closing, a lot of services are closing, uh, there's a lot of mass panic, a lot of worry around the place. Um, but businesses need to start having to think about how they're going to continue to operate if they can even continue to operate. So it really depends on the organization itself. Some organizations are going to be better equipped than others to be able to have staff working uh, remotely than others. Uh, different industries uh, will have to deal with this very differently. Some industries may not be able to allow staff to work from home because they're reliant on staff being in an office with physical systems or equipment that they have in an office. Other organizations may have the possibility to allow staff or certain staff to work from home. Now this is something that you're going to have to deal with and discuss internally uh, with the relevant people to ensure that the right people can work from home while others may have to have an alternate, uh, you know, a leave policy or leave plan uh, if they cannot have their job working in a remote location. So let's talk a little bit about a disaster recovery plan or a DRP. If you don't have a DRP, this is something you need to write up almost immediately. A DRP essentially outlines what an organization does uh, from a technology perspective in the event of a disaster. So given that this coronavirus is at pandemic levels, um, a lot of companies are starting to now consider. Some have initiated their DRPs uh, to really outline what IT, what the systems, uh, will, you know, what will happen with the systems in the event of this pandemic causing impact to the business. So the DRP really outlines a number of different processes and steps that certain individuals, generally in the IT department, will follow uh, to ensure that systems are protected, to ensure that systems can be recovered and restored after a, a disaster event has happened. Along with the DRP is what's called the BCP. A BCP is a business continuity plan. Essentially, it outlines how the business will operate, what the business model will look, who the vendors are, who you need to contact, where you're going to meet from a business perspective. And the DRP, the Disaster Recovery Plan, fits into the technology element of the larger BCP. So these two documents will work hand in hand, the BCP and the DRP, but ensuring that both of them are in existence and both of them are updated. Right now is the best time to update it and make sure that it's going to work and that you're going to be following the correct process to be able to be protected and continue staff working through the coronavirus. So within the DRP, there's going to be various sections. Um, you're going to also want to be referencing another document in the DRP, which is around your current backup system process and recovery process. So most organizations would have uh, a number of systems, servers, you've got data, potentially located in one or more locations, one or more data centers, server rooms scattered around a building or buildings, uh, and that data is backed up to one or several locations, wherever that may be. So there needs to be an accompanying document with the DRP around what your current backup process is. People in IT, people who are reading the disaster recovery plan should be able to know where your data is being backed up to. In the event that your server, your comms rooms, your primary production environment is compromised, uh, you need to know where your data is being backed up to and how to restore that. So that is gonna include things like the applications that you're using, the processes, how often backups are you know, taking place, the schedules, 
uh, the retention periods, where it's going, if it's going on premise, if it's going to a remote site, if it's going to tape, if it's going to cloud, if it's going to disk, wherever it is going, there needs to be outlined in sort of a process uh, document around backups, and then also the recovery on how do you recover this data. This is possibly a good time as well to ensure that your data can be recovered. A lot of organizations have got a good process around backing up data and the backups are successful and they back up every single night, but then you're not actually actively testing that the restores are working. So could be, you know, this could be a good time to now test restoring data, restoring production environments, restoring servers, virtual servers, and getting them live again, so that if you do need to go down that route, you can restore things. Part of this um, disaster recovery plan or pack, uh, you'll also include a list of all of your vendors. Uh, of course, the BCP is going to outline who your customers are, your stakeholders, um, you know, in and outside of the organization, uh, but there also needs to be a list of all of your vendors, your suppliers, your, um, you, know, you know, if you're dealing with managed services providers, your ISPs, your internet service providers, uh, all that sort of stuff needs to be listed. You need to have primary contacts, who you're going to contact in the event that you need to use that particular service. Let's say you have, uh, you know, a phone service running from your business that is hosted outside. Uh, you need to know who the contacts are and what their process is in an event such as this around a pandemic. So outlining all of your vendors, your suppliers, all in one single document so that anybody can pick that up and know exactly who they call, who the primary contacts are, and what that particular organization, that vendor, supplier, uh, provider do for the organization. The disaster recovery plan needs to be uh, located in various locations. Um, there's no point in keeping it in one server because if that server is compromised or has an issue, then it sort of defeats the point. So having it in more than one place, having it across multiple servers, if you have more than one site, having it across different sites, the same copy, having it on the cloud, having it on a different backup tape on an external hard drive, also having physical printed copies is very important. In the event where systems are unavailable, let's say uh, you know, the electrical systems are compromised and power is out, uh, in, a, in a server room, your UPS is your backup power is depleted. You need to have physical printed copies of your disaster recovery plan. Uh, they could be in your comms rooms, they could be in a safe, they could be in certain allocated you know, people's homes uh, kept outside of the organization also. So as part of a disaster recovery plan, uh, you need to know who's gonna be involved, um, who are the right people you need to contact within the organization. So you have some sort of a disaster recovery panel or a board that are the people who need to know what is going on in a disaster recovery scenario. Uh, they're the people you're gonna contact, there's escalation points, and then you're gonna be creating a sort of like a disaster recovery task force, panel, group of people that are now tasked with uh, initiating the disaster recovery plan and uh, you know allocating responsibilities and roles for certain individuals or certain teams to be able to restore operations. So you're thinking about things like uh, there's going to be a coordinator, there's going to be maybe a director of the disaster recovery, there's going to be a management team, then there's going to be a team of technical people, network people, systems people, backup people, storage people, whoever you need who are specialists in a particular area. Their role is to ensure that that data is secure, that data is backed up, that data is upright, that data is uh, got high availability, fault tolerance, uh, and they're the people who are going to be responsible for restoring operations, whatever that may look like after the pandemic has ended. So have people that you're thinking about. Um, if you haven't plotted this out already, start to allocate individuals that are gonna be responsible for acting out the disaster recovery plan. There are specific roles and responsibilities. If you have a smaller team, you may need to seek external help. So perhaps look at partnering with a third party company, a managed service provider, somebody who is an expert in IT across various fields that can add value to your organization so that they can initiate or assist you in a disaster recovery uh, operation. Within the disaster recovery plan, you need to know uh, what your systems look like. So it'd be good to include uh, an up-to-date uh, asset register. So an asset register would be something that contains a list of all of your hardware. Uh, so all the hardware that you've got in operation across your organization, all your desktops, your PCs, your servers, your phones, your you know, security cameras, whatever it may be, should all hopefully have some sort of an asset tracking number, 
uh, and then a, you know, in an asset register, have the name, the description, who's using it, uh, what is running on that, you know, software that is running, um, and, and essentially what that is, so that in the event where everything is compromised, uh, then you know how to, well, you've got a list of everything, so you know that what you need to procure um, afterwards. Apart from that, your core systems, your core servers, your networking equipment, your firewalls, you need to know how that is configured from a very, very high level at least. Uh, know what your physical servers are doing. You know, let's say your physical servers are acting as a VMware ESXi host. How many are there? Do they have high availability? Do they have DRS? What do your virtual servers look like? What are they doing? How do you restore them? Are there, uh, you know, is there redundancy between them? What are your switches doing? How are they set up? Are they set up in stacks? Are they set up, you know, what particular VLANs are configured? Uh, you need to know things like your, your firewalls, how they're configured, what your firewall port you know, rules are like, how the ACLs are configured, what ports are open, what is being blocked, what is not being blocked. Uh, exporting configs of a lot of these devices regularly and ensuring that they're all in the one location in this disaster recovery sort of plan pack uh, helps you so that in the event you need to restore anything, you've got up-to-date configs. So that is also true of all of your switches, uh, and any, any routers that you may have. How many desktops you have, how many laptops you have, how many uh, are in use by staff, how many are spares. Do you need to purchase additional equipment prior to, uh, you know, let's say we're now getting ready for a uh, closure of the office, you need to have additional laptops that you need to purchase to allow staff to work remotely. What's the plan gonna be around your VoIP, your phone services, uh, are you going to reroute traffic to alternate phones, to mobile phones? Are you going to have VoIP on, on the cloud using some sort of a service like Zoom or, or Skype or something similar? You should have a good understanding outlined in this document uh, around the software and the applications that are used in the organization. Core applications that are critical to the business operating, some applications you cannot live without. So you need to have some sort of plan to know how you're gonna to continue to run that operation or how you're gonna be able to restore that application once it's done. Something, a good example would be emails. Like how do you deal with your emails being down? Uh, how is your email service gonna to continue to work if you are now working from home, for example? Understanding as well what applications can be uh, sacrificed, what services, what core systems can be sacrificed. Uh, how long you need to be keeping data for these. This is called the RPO and RTO, sort of having times against certain core systems, core applications, how often you should be backing them up, and essentially when does the application or the system become irrelevant because that data is no longer available, uh, you know, the, the data is no longer useful because you've uh, been out of operations for two, three days. So having that outlined in there uh, gives you a good guide on maybe perhaps what applications are more critical what services are more critical than others. The disaster recovery plan also needs to outline uh, different scenarios, uh, different things. So server down, network down, data center, power loss, etc. But then there's also a section that a lot of places may overlook is your environmental pandemic um, scenarios. These are things that are outside of your control. These are things that are natural. These are things that are just um, happening. And there needs to be a plan in place about how to deal with that. So given that we are talking here about a pandemic, you need to be aware that the operations uh, could be similar to say something of a uh, data center going down, but you're gonna have to treat this slightly differently given that it's a pandemic as opposed to a data center going down. So given that it's a pandemic, we've got uh, a number of different uh, roles and responsibilities which we touched on earlier. Every single uh, person, individual or group will have a specific responsibility during this disaster recovery phase. So this is going to be informing relevant people around the organization, speaking to relevant vendors, making vendors aware, making vendors take necessary action to stop or start or restart certain services to halt certain services. Uh, you really want to just, you know, whoever's coordinating this thing from a disaster recovery perspective needs to be very good at communication and be able to inform whoever needs to be informed of what the business um, approach and steps are going to be. They're really coordinating the whole thing, right? They're coordinating um, from a high level, the, the business from a technical perspective, from a technology, keeping the CEO, directors, whoever it needs to be involved, but they're also coordinating the, the team members within this, this disaster recovery team. So they're gonna also include perhaps other senior people, perhaps team leads of different 
system organizations, perhaps a team of IT people, perhaps one internal IT people person, and a team of external IT people if they're in a smaller organization. Then each individual techni technical person is gonna be responsible for a number of tasks. Reviewing systems, reviewing services, setting certain processes up in place, setting certain remote processes up in place, uh, ensuring that backups are taking place, testing the backups, ensuring that systems are, are, um, are running correctly, that high availability is set up in place. And then on the flip side, making sure that they can restore operations at the end of it all. Of course, every technical member of this disaster recovery plan will be an expert in that particular field. So you've got a systems person who's gonna be responsible for perhaps for servers, uh, making sure that the virtualization for physical servers, for virtual servers, are all set up correctly, that things like exchange, database service, file servers are all set up, that they know the ins and outs of the whole thing to be able to continue operations uh, in a partial state, in a, in, a, in a very small state, or turn them off altogether, and then how to restore things. The network people may be responsible for more from a switching routing perspective, perhaps a firewall security type of person looking after that, looking after the links, out to the internet, making sure that they're correct, making sure that things like VPN are working, that they're working correctly, because if staff need to work remotely, they need to be able to use VPN, be able to route in, tunnel into the network, access everything that they can access. So ensuring that the entire thing is done correctly and then restoring things at the end. And then looking at uh, application people, uh, development people, people who are now dealing with the apps, app support, devs, uh, you know, that they could have multiple dev tests, staging environments, production environments that they look after, coding practices, uh, really looking after all the application stack, making sure that that is all, you know, whatever needs to be done, prepared, protected beforehand, during the operation, during the pandemic, making sure that things are um, accessible. Uh, some things may not need to be accessible, so I'm putting those right, place, right things in place. And then, as we said before, is then restoring everything at the end of it. So that's a summary, really, of the disaster recovery plan uh, and what you need to now be putting in place or what I recommend strongly putting in place uh, and at least rehearsing it, ensuring that the business has buy into this um, during this pandemic, during the coronavirus. Um, you don't want to wait too long. You don't want to wait till your business, your CEO, whoever comes to you and says, all right, we've now got to um, close the business, get everything running, and then you're sort of scrambling and making it up as you're going. So it's good to, for you to spend maybe a bit of time uh, writing up your disaster recovery plan, making sure you've got a good overview of every single thing that needs to be included in there, uh, getting buy-in, making sure that staff are aware what needs to be done, and if you need to put processes in place around working from home, uh, I've got, I'm gonna record another video right after this one, which you will find straight after here, around uh, working from home. Uh, how do you put practices in place to allow staff to work from home in uh, this time, in this crazy time that we're living in around the pandemic, the uncertainty that is happening. Uh, staff may wanna work from home. Staff may be encouraged to work from home. Some businesses cannot afford staff um, well, can't, can't afford businesses to be closed. So the working from home perhaps may be the only option available, but you need to make sure you've got the right system and the right services in place in the background to be able to enable that. So we're gonna talk about that in the next video, but for now, that is it. I would love it if you gave me a thumbs up, subscribe as well to Digital Bike Computing for a whole bunch of more videos. Click on the little notification button there to get up-to-date information uh, and videos that I'm releasing. But anyway, that's all for now. I uh, hope you found it helpful uh, and we'll talk to you soon.